Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Mario Sanchez, and I run training here at Sumo Logic. And today we're going to be going through this quick start webinar. As the uh, as the uh, subtitle here suggests, this prepares you for that level one certification to become a Sumo Pro user. Um, and thanks for those of you who actually voted. Here is the results of the quick poll. It looks like most of you are number one, which is need help getting started, which is great you're in the right webinar. Um, that's what we're gonna be covering today. And th for those of you who are number two, um, this is good as well. This is the, the right audience uh, and the right webinar to be. We're gonna start with a 30,000 foot view and then start diving into more and more of the details and the, and the harder stuff that you can do with Sumo. Um, so a little bit of housekeeping. You notice that everybody's on mute. Uh, feel free to send questions through the questions tab. I'll try to answer as we go, but we'll also have time at the end for a little bit of, um, of questions. And uh, the second thing is I will record this session and I will share the recording with all of you as well as the slides. Um, I'll send you an email with that kind of stuff. So with that said, let's let's get started. Um, I'm gonna be co covering the, the five steps to become a Sumo Pro user. So one is, what does the end game look like? How, do, how can Sumo Logic help me? And I'm gonna go through a demo, in, in my case, a troubleshooting demo, but um, basically showing you how Sumo Logic can help you. Um, what, what does the end result look like? And then we'll backtrack and we'll start with, how can I use Sumo? So for one is what data is available. Let's say that Sumo is already up and running and I'm a new analyst or a new developer and I wanna get some info from uh, from my logs. What, what logs are available for me to start analyzing? What metrics are available? How can I search them? How can I parse them? How can I analyze them? And then uh, number four is, um, great, so I now have my analytics in place. How can I monitor this stuff? How can I look at trends? How can I look at outliers? How can I um, create dashboards and alerts that, that, uh, that tell me when there's critical events? going on and then last but not least we'll touch upon uh, where do you go from here what's what's the next step in terms of uh, learning sumo uh, what you will see me do today is a lot of uh, demo I'll demo a lot of pieces but the good news for you is that there is a training environment that you guys have access to here's a user and password for that and a lot of the labs or all of the labs that I will be running through today are on this same instance so you actually get a chance to try all this stuff out there's a tutorial you can try out with this same user and that's all part of preparing for that certification that I was mentioning before. Second thing is, if you have questions during the webinar, obviously feel free to send them to me, but if you have questions down the road, you can do. Uh, you can always join our community and you can do this from the UI, I'll show you in a little bit, um, as well as joining a Slack conversation um, in our Learn Sumo channel as well. So like I said, this is the first step to prepare you for that level one uh, Sumo Pro user. You notice here under prep, there's the quick start webinar and the tutorial. And um, and now that should get you uh, on your way to uh, becoming a Sumo Pro user, level two, a power user, and so on. So as, you, as, as most of you know, um, this webinar is part of a series of three webinars. Uh, you probably went to the same page that I'm showing you here to register, Sumo Logic Quick Start, but there's another one called Sumo Logic, which starts tomorrow. And, a third one even is called setting up Sumo Logic that it's targeted more to administrators, but um, talks about data collection and deployment options and all that good stuff. So for each one of these webinars, um, there is a corresponding certification that goes with it. There's a little more than the webinar. There's a little bit of tutorials and ha some hands-on labs that we suggest, um, but this should get you on your way to level one all the way up to level three um, certification. You can take the exams right from this same location in here. All right, so <clears throat> excuse me. With that said, let's go. Um, let's go into uh, into Sumo. So let me start with the thirty thousand foot view in terms of data flow. Um, uh, actually, be, before I go into data flow, let, let's talk about in, in terms of a demo. What I'm going to show you is how you can use Sumo Logic um, to troubleshoot. How do, how do you relate your logs to your metrics? And what I'm going to show you is. Um, you get some sort of a notification. This could be a Slack notification, this could be an email, or perhaps you have in your operation center, you have a dashboard that is showing you everything that is going on in your environment. So you notif you, you, you're you alerted of some critical event, and what you wanna do is you start diving into your environment, and one of the first things that you'll probably do is you're gonna start looking at the metrics because metrics help you identify the what. What is going on in my environment? In our case, what is happening is that we're having some, um, some bookings that are, that are failing. 
right? But the key here is, yes, I know what is going on, but I want to identify what is causing it. Why is this happening? And that's where I'm going to show you how to correlate it to the relevant logs so you can start identifying the why. Why is happening? Logs tend to give us the, the cause, and with that, we can then take an action as to how we want to solve it. So with that said, let me jump into a demo in here um, and, and try to show you. Actually, before I just jump into the demo, let me show you what this is, uh, what my fake company here is. I have a company called Travelogic. And in this um, company, you can book your flights, you can book your hotel, your car, you can put stuff in the, in the, the uh, in the cart and then go and pay for all your stuff, right? This Travelogic site has been built on, um, it's a modern app, very similar to whatever you guys are running. You, it's, been, it's been built with services or microservices, I should say. It's got Kubernetes, it's got the, the works. And so how do you keep an eye on the health of an environment like this one? So what I've done here, it's let, let's pretend that I am the uh, ops guy for Travelogic. Um, what I have here is a, oops, I keep uh, doing the lo wrong one. Here we go. I'm, I have a dashboard that is giving me an operational overview of everything that is going on in Travelogic. As a matter of fact, let me refresh it. And um, this dashboard is sitting in my operations center. And normally, on a good day, everything shows green in here. However, today for the purposes of this demo, I've actually inserted quite a few errors into my Travelogic instance so that they reflect here on this dashboard. And um, I could have received an, uh, a Slack alert. You notice that in this case, I have uh, alerts that are being automatically delivered to the Travel Ops channel. Um, I'm going to sp skip that part of the demo. So in this case, I just look, at, look up at my dashboard and I see a lot of red. Um, before I dive into this, let me just show you what this is giving me. A, a, it's giving me a big view of, of everything that I care about, my reporting nodes. Perhaps I want to keep an eye on my uh, 500s that are coming from my elastic load balancer. I can keep an eye on my response times from my ELB. I see my network rejects from my VPC network, um, some database issues. Any of these, by the way, I can um, always enlarge and find it a little more information of what I'm seeing. All I did was click on this little icon here that gives me more detail. Um, but I can see my database. I can see my payment transactions. I can see any issues that I'm having in the UI in my administrative UI, any worker issues. Um, in particular, I see that I have a large number of issues with my checkout service. Um, and this is pretty bad. From a business perspective, this means that people are trying to book travel on my site, but when they go to the cart and try to check out, um, they're not being able to check out because uh, they're failing to, uh, um, my, my bookings are failing. This is my checkout fair, uh, service is failing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna click on this checkout service um, uh, tile in here, and that's gonna take me to another dashboard that is giving me a little more detail about the, um, the services. And what I notice, the first thing that I notice in here is my bookings. Let me enlarge this one here just to show you. Here's the bookings for my uh, uh, that are coming from my site, and it looks like everything is great. He, these are the number of successful bookings, and things were great just about until 9:52, 9:53, right? Which is when I was preparing for this demo, I inserted some errors, and then all of a sudden, my number of successful bookings drops. You see the little shaded area down behind the orange, but. Uh, what's even worse is that I have a big increase in failed bookings. And if you notice in this case, that bubble there is showing me that I have 54 failed bookings at this particular point in time. So what you're seeing is I'm using my metrics to help me identify the what, what is going on. Clearly from a business perspective, there's an issue. I am uh, having a lot of fails in my bookings and people cannot book. I perhaps have already a few calls into my support center um, that people cannot book their flights and, and their car hires and their hotels, right? Let me just uh, walk you through a few of these other uh, panels to show you how you would go about um, troubleshooting this. Here's another one showing me errors in the last seven days. And let me make this a little bit bigger just to show you. But what this is trying to show me here 
here is how many errors did I have at this same point in time? So from 9, 10 a.m. all the way to like uh, 10, 30 a.m., how many errors was I having three days ago and four days ago and five days ago? And it's clear that it's flatlined for all the periods in time. So this is not a common error at this point in time. What this is showing me is that today, I happen to have quite a few errors at this particular point in time, starting at 9.50. So it's not a recurring error. It's not something that happens daily. It's something, it's some anomaly that is happening today. Um, I can see another type of, um, uh, metrics or, or or errors showing in here. This is my gateway latency, and it looks like everything was going okay. Um, but then at some point, again, around the same time, 9.50, my latency went and spiked up, and I'm having some outliers here denoted by these pink triangles. So you start seeing that everything on my dashboard is kind of relating to the fact that sometime around 9.52, something happened and I started having spikes. Here's my, um, here's the delta of my gateway latency. All of a sudden the delta had a huge spike again around that same time. And this one's pretty interesting too. This one is showing me errors by node. So it's saying that um, there's a couple of nodes here. And if you look at that little bubble that popped up there that says source name, it says CS team travel checkout. So it's some travel checkout node that is having an issue. This one also is another travel checkout node. So I have a couple of travel checkout nodes that are having um, a huge spike in issues. This one doesn't have, seem to have that, that many errors. This is a travel worker one, another travel worker one with just a small count of errors. So um, I use this dashboard to start narrowing down and starting to identify the 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 reason of, or at least the cause, what's happening in my environment. I still don't know what's going on, but I have a good idea that something happened like around 9.50, 9.52 that started creating a lot of errors. Let's take a peek at this one over here. This one's called CPU and total memory. And I can see that uh, my CPU levels were pretty stable for actually for all my different nodes in here. Um, but then all of a sudden, look at this purple one here. Again, around uh, 9.52, I have a huge spike in travel checkout in, my, in this travel checkout node, showing me that my CPU total uh, went up the roof. So what I'm gonna do is instead of just looking at this, I'm gonna dive using this little icon in here, I'm gonna dive to the back end so that I can, um, so that I can um, play with this and, and find out a little more information. Again, this one is showing me CPU and total memory. My total memory seems to be okay. Is this is this uh, dotted line in here? So I'm gonna I'm gonna toggle that one off so it doesn't distract me. Um, if you notice in here, this one is the one that is bringing me my CPU metric. This one's bringing me my uh, memory usage. So I'm gonna just turn that off by clicking here. Now I have a better picture of what's going on. As a matter of fact, I think there's two lines in here, right? There's a, there's a purple line and there's a red line that both happen to be uh, going in there. Um, but it looks like there's a couple of travel checkout nodes that are hurting. And, and by the way, I can zoom into this stuff if I need to as well. Um, on my graphs, and yeah, there, there you see that it's actually two different lines in there, right? Um, so anyway, what's causing this stuff? I really want to understand what's going on, why am I having these kinds of errors, and what I would really want to do is I want to find out what the logs are saying around that time. And this is the really cool thing that I was talking about before. Remember that demo that I told you? I use the metrics to find out what's going on. Now let me dive into the relevant logs to find out why this is happening. And I'm going to I'm going about to show you this. In this query that is showing me metrics only, I have the ability to enter some logs queries. And I'm I'm gonna cover later on the details of all this logs queries. But what I'm gonna do, do is I'm gonna use some metadata. And metadata is just some tags that get put on every single log message uh, so that I can easily search them be, later on. And I'll talk about each one of these later on. But for now, I'm gonna use one called source category. And this is just a tag. This is just a way to tag the messages so that I can find them easily later on. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look for that travel checkout stuff. So this is a customer service team, travel checkout, and I wanna find out all the logs that were happening around that time. Uh, same time period, right? Last 60 minutes. So here it is. Here's my metrics still showing what was going on. And then this little bar that, I, that is at the top 
is um, think of it as a heat map. The darker the, the box, the more messages that happen to be there. So if you notice this one that is somewhat light had about 360 messages at that time, but this one that is in here had 1,600 messages at that time. So let me make this query a little more interesting. Rather than looking for all the logs across this time period, why don't I look for logs that had the word error in it? Because that's probably what I'm looking for. What's, what's the error being cost in here, right? Oh, and look at that, that's, that's a little more telling. So what this is showing is, here's my metrics, everything was going well until around 952, 953. And then I don't have any logs with the word error in there until that same time period. So now I can see that I have quite a bit of errors happening around that time. So wouldn't we wanna find out what those errors are, right? What you can do is you can click on any of these boxes, and it's going to toggle the bottom screen to show you the errors that we're showing in that particular point in time. So here we go. Look at this one. This is saying that um, there was some SSL routine, some certificate of sorts, some, some error around the certificate itself. This one has some other an error around processing credit payment. Um, this is some error around access denied and so on. So I could, I could scroll through all these and try to figure out what's going on. Um, or I could use the power of Sumo to try to help me identify what's going on. So instead of just clicking here and looking at each individual error and eyeballing it, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do a shift click and a shift click allows me to open that same query for that same time period. Uh, but now it gives me a lot more tools to deal with these uh, with these uh, logs. And one of the tools that we'll, we'll be using is this one called Log Reduce. And think of Log Reduce as an easy button. But before I use it, let me do something. Very often, the cause of an error does not have the word error in it. So what I'm going to do is I am going to expand my query. I'm just going to look for more stuff. Give me everything from the source category travel checkout. And uh, I'm going to choose uh, for the last 60 minutes. So I could even choose a bigger time frame. It doesn't matter. What, essentially, what I want to do is I want to find out the culprit for this, what's going on in my environment. So now I have 60 minutes worth of travel checkout logs. That's about 59,000 messages. That's a lot of messages to eyeball. And I'm not going to eyeball them. Instead, instead what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this log reduce button. And what log reduce is doing right now for me, that easy button that I was talking about before is, it's comparing all those 59,000 messages and it's saying, hey Mario, listen, it looks like 25,000 messages, 26,000 messages. Let me make this a little bit bigger for you guys. Um, that might be better. Okay, so what it's doing is it's saying there's about 10,000 messages that all have this kind of same format. Of course, the date is different, and perhaps the IP address is different, or the message, the port number is going to be different, the transaction ID is different, but the format of the message is very, very similar. So that's what it did. It went out and it categorized those 60,000 messages into, into what we call signatures. And now I don't have to sift through about 9,000 messages because they all got put into this one bucket. And it did the same for all those other messages. Um, remember that SSL error message that I was getting before? There it is. Here's the here's the SSL routine message. Well, guess what? There were about 1,700 of those messages. So I no longer have to sift through all those. Um, I no longer have to sift through all those messages because it is because it it put them into a signature that makes it a lot easier for me to sift through. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look for something whatever it thinks it's a relevant message, and um, and sure enough, look what comes up to the top. Here is a message that only happened twice. So I could have sorted this a couple of ways. I could have sorted it by relevance. I could have sorted it by count. Like I don't care for those messages just happen a lot. Those That's just noise. What are those things that don't happen all that much? And from one of the things that doesn't happen all that much is this guy in here. It's the starting of the travel app cluster. And if I pay a little bit of attention in here, I notice that what happened is it looks like someone deployed version 1.4 dev. So someone deployed development code into my production environment. And 
most likely if I connect the dots in here, this is the cause of having the wrong uh, SSL certificate, which is what's causing my, uh, which is which is what is causing my uh, my uh, CPU, all these fails, which is causing my CPU to fail, and it's causing my bookings to fail. So you you saw how I went from looking at metrics and understanding from a business perspective what's going on, diving into the machine itself, looking at the metrics for that particular machine, but then diving straight into the logs and identifying in the logs themselves um, what is going on with my logs that is causing those problems in there, where actually it was this query that we were on. Um, going all the way and finding out that there's development code in that query. So um, that is just one example of how you can go about uh, relating your logs and metrics. But what I wanted to show you was the end game, having these, having these dashboards and these alerts in place. What I'm going to show you today in this next uh, 40 minutes is how to create these queries, how to create these dashboards, how to create these alerts so you can have an environment like that that makes it a lot easier for you to, uh, to do your troubleshooting. All right, um, I don't see any questions, so I'm gonna move forward. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to use the uh, question tab in here. So from a 30,000 foot view, um, Sumo Logic breaks the data flow into three areas, data collection, searching and analyzing, visualizing and monitoring. Today, we're gonna spend most of our time in number two and number three, how do I search and visualize? We're gonna assume that someone already collected that, that data for us. If you wanna find out about data collection, there's a webinar on Friday that you can join. But having said that, let me just briefly, briefly talk about number one here uh, very, very quickly. So sending data to Sumo, is, it's actually not that difficult. There's two ways to do it. One is what we call cloud to cloud integration. So you have your AWS stuff in your S3 bucket and you can send that over to Sumo Logic. Or perhaps you have a, you have a, um, uh, cloud to cloud log collection for SaaS or past platforms. So Google Apps or Office 365, you can use an API to send the, that stuff over. Um, you can even just do a straight up HTTPS post over to us. So we have some customers that they do client side logs um, that are being sent over to us. So the, the top half of this is what we call cloud to cloud integration. If your logs actually reside on your machines, then there's two ways that you can send those logs over to us. One is you can install a Sumo Logic collector on each one of your machines, and then we collect the data from there, and that gets sent over to Sumo Logic. However, if you're um, if you do not have internet access or outside access from those machines, you can use something like this other uh, bottom left corner in here, where you have um, you have a central collector. Um, and by the way, if you already have central collection infrastructure, we would highly recommend this kind of method. So you have a central collector, and then you can SSH or WMI your logs over to that collector and onto Sumo Logic. And you can use the same thing if you have network devices like firewalls, routers. You can syslog that stuff over to that collector and then onto Sumo Logic. So several ways of collecting your data. Uh, but one of the things I wanted to mention is that every single message, every single log message that comes over to Sumo Logic gets tagged with the following five metadata tags. This is, these are the ones I was mentioning before. The name of the collector it came through, the name of the host that it came through, uh, source name, which is the name and the path of the log file. Uh, but the one I really wanted to point out is this one called source category. It can be anything you want. And because it can be freely configured, it, we most often use it as a main metadata tag. You will see in my training environment how we've used this source category tag uh, to make it a lot easier for us to search. So having said that, um, you guys find yourselves as a new Sumo user in a screen very similar to, let me just close some of these guys here, in a screen very similar to this one. Uh, this is when you first log on, it looks something like this. Uh, you have your left navigation bar where you where you can find some of the administrative stuff and so on. Um, if you're brand spanking new to Sumo, you might not have recently opened dashboards and run searches, so this will be empty for you. Um, but you can always start a new search from here. You can click on new and start a new log search, a new metric search, a live tail, which I'll talk in a second, or you can start it from any of these icons. Um, but you probably wouldn't even know what to search for. Let me start a new log search and you get this icon in here and you're like, hmm, what data is in my environment? How do I actually find out? So before you jump into this, let me show you how. What you want to do is, there's two ways. One is you can go to your collections page and explore what collectors have been set up in your environment. To do that, 
you go into uh, manage data and under collection, you would see all the different collectors that have been set up. So in my case, there's eight pages worth of collectors. I'll show you in a second how to uh, narrow this down. But um, you can see that I have a collector called Artif Artifactory. And this is giving me Artifactory access data, Artifactory request, server and server traffic data. Perhaps you have AWS CloudWatch data and sending me EBS and EC2 and RDS data, so database data as well. Um, here I have another one that is sending me CloudFront, CloudTrail config, and you get the point. I'm, I'm getting quite a few different uh, um, collectors in here that are all that are sending me different types of data. Perhaps I'm looking for Apache data, so you can always hit enter enter the word here, and now this is showing me anything that is sending me Apache data. Notice that we have some labs at Apache access data. We'll be using this a lot for our training. Um, you can do something like um, Oh, sorry. Let me let me take a step back. So for each one of these, there there are metadata tags, right? If I want to look for this Labs Apache data, I can look for this collector, I can look for this source, or I can look for this source category. And you notice that there's little icons that come up every time I hover over them. What that does is it allows me to run a query, so I can click on that little icon, and it's going to build that query for me. So now I'm running a query showing me all my Apache access logs for the last 15 minutes. And there you go, here are the results. As a matter of fact, I get 107,000 messages in the, last, uh, in the last 15 minutes from Apache access data, right? So again, uh, one of the ways to find out what data is available to you is go into the collections under manage and you see what collectors have been set up. There is a second cheekier way of finding out what's, uh, what source categories are sending you data, and that is to run a query um, like this one. What this is doing is saying, give me everything for the last, let's say, five minutes, and then send those results. This pipe means take those results and send them to the next operator, and the next operator is just counting by source category. And what that does is let's, let's run that query. I'm going to go back to my search here and say, give me everything. I'm going to do an alt enter to go to the next line and then say give me all those results and count them by source category. Remember source category is the uh, is one of the my metadata tags and I can run that query and I can see what uh, what source categories are in my environment. So that's yet another way of finding out. I could have done the same thing by uh, looking by source host. So if you wanted to find out which source which hosts are getting the most data, you could do that as well. In my case I have some uh, host there by IP address. I could do it by source name and you get the point. But um, the idea is finding out what source categories have a little bit of information here for you. All right. So um, let's say that, yes, you found out that you have Apache data, which is exactly what you were looking for um, because your boss told you that you wanted to find out, um, you wanted to start analyzing your Apache, your web server logs. So you went in here, you see that there is Apache data. Um, wherever that was, yeah, you, you're getting a lot of Apache data, and now you want to start analyzing that data. So I'm going to show you today how to run, how to create queries, how to run queries, and all that good stuff. But if you were um, if you were a little lazy like I am, the first thing that I would do is find out, hey, has some other has someone else, has my peer already done some queries against the Apache data? Because if they have, I don't want to recreate the wheel, right? So what I'm going to show you first is, um, let's find out if there's any published content. Has someone already analyzed the same data that I'm about to analyze? So I'm going to show you how to go into the library and search that stuff. So the library, let me just close some of these tabs here to make it a little easier. The library is found um, in two places. I can, in my left nav, find my personal library and the library for the entire organization. Or if you want a little bit more real estate to see it a little easier, you can always go to this icon, which is the same library in there. So here is my personal library. This is stuff that I have built. I'm gonna go click in personal and I have some folders in here that I'll be taking advantage of later on as we go through this session. Or I could go to the whole org folder and I can see anyone who has published content in this training instance. And by the way, there's a lot of users. Look at this. This is a training instance that we use for a lot of training delivery. Um, so I don't even know what content is in there. There could be some fishy content in there. But 
today I'm looking for some Apache stuff. So I'm gonna even I'm gonna look. I could look for the word web server because maybe that's what people called it, um, or most likely they probably called it Apache. So if I look for the word Apache, what I just got returned is all the content that exists in this instance that has the word Apache that my peers have decided to share. And why do I see so much? The reason you see so much and with the same name is because we go through a lab that makes all the training users install um, install a, an app and that app has out of the box content. So that's, that's the reason you're seeing the same. But in your environment, you would probably get one or two of these results. And um, it's great because I can open any of these. Let me just grab this one, for example. And, um, Let's see if this thing loads, but loading, loading, it's still loading. Um, there we go. So I get some results and, and this is pretty cool because I haven't had to do any work. I still don't know how to create a search in Sumo, yet I already have some good uh, results that are showing up in here. So again, my, um, my, my recommendation to you is always check. It's very possible that someone has already created something very similar to what you're looking for. Um, here is the other cooler thing about this is that if you find a dashboard, even if it's a dashboard created by someone else, in this case, um, there is a user called the Labs User Training who owns this dashboard. It's not even mine, right? But this dashboard, I can always go and look at the query that was built for that dashboard. This looks ridiculously crazy right now, but at the end of today, you will be able to understand what this is. My point to you is um, you can always learn from the queries that are already in place. You don't have to start from scratch. You can take a query that is doing something very similar to what you want to, and then you can take that query and tweak it um, to something that might make sense for you. Okay, so the first thing is uh, find out if someone has already analyzed that data. Let's say that our results came up empty. We went in here, we searched for Apache, and we got nothing. There was no results down there. So your second best bet is check out if we have a Sumo Logic app for your source, right? And what that means, what we mean by an app is out of the box content that will work for your um, for your environment and you can search the app catalog. Let me just show you how to get to that. Again, left nav. I'm going to go to the app catalog over here. And in here, I'm seeing all the different apps that Sumo Logic has. And these are common sources. So we've got a lot of customers that are wanting to analyze their CloudTrail logs or their um, metrics for their AWS um, ELB, or perhaps their Amazon RDS metrics, or they here's Apache, oh, look at this. Here's the Apache one that I'm looking for. Um, Box, Cisco, uh, CloudStrike, C Silence. So again, a lot of common sources that uh, that we've already created the content for you. And I'm, it's true, this might not have 100% of what you need, but it certainly will have 80, if not 90 or 95% of what you need. So let me walk you through the steps of installing an app because it's super easy. I'm gonna go here to the Apache one. I can even preview the dashboards. If I wanna see what it's going in to, to install before I actually install it, I can preview them through here. Um, and if I like what I see, I can click on add to library. So it's gonna ask me, okay, what do you want to name your uh, the folder where I'm gonna install all this? So I'm gonna call it Apache app and uh, 2018, since this is the first one I'm doing for this year. Um, and then it, it says, okay, how do I marry the data to how do how do I tell it that what your Apache data is? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, well, the way to identify my Apache data is by looking for Labs Apache Access. And if I find it here, there we go. So any data that has source category Labs Apache Access, I want you to, to include it into this um, into this dashboard. And I'm going to click Add to Library. And what it's doing right now, it's, it's literally making a copy of all those dashboards and all those queries that you see here. And it's pre-appending source category equals Labs Apache Access. And there you go. In my personal folder, I have a new folder called Apache Apps, uh, Apache App 2018. And in there, I have all these different dashboards and queries that I can look at. Um, so I'm just gonna open one of these. And in the meantime, let me answer one of the queries um, 
that I'm getting from Andrea. Andrea is saying, do I install the app for myself or for the organization? Now, oh, that's, a, that's a great question, Andrea. So uh, again, Andrea's question is, should I install this app for myself or should I install it for the whole org? And the answer is, you probably at the beginning are exploring and you install it for yourself and you're looking at that app and you're like, oh man, this is great. This is exactly what we need. And so what you will want to do, Andrea, as soon as you do that is you go back to your labs, um, to your library, and you remember that app Apache uh, folder that is in here. What you will want to do is you will want to share this folder. You will want to publish this folder so that everybody else can benefit from this uh, from these this app that you just installed. So sharing is caring and I can't tell you enough how much you will want to share. Even if it's a dashboard that you built from scratch, share it because it's most likely uh, it's very likely that someone else is going to be looking for that kind of content. Uh, so thanks for your question, Andrea. You you do want to, you, you install it for yourself, but then you share it and you make it available to everyone. Um, speaking of which, in the next, I will say, month or so, we're coming up with con with a new content sharing feature. Right now, if I share this, so let's say, Andrea, that I install this and I share it. I still own it, but everybody can view it. Um, in the very near future, we're coming out with a model where many people can manage it as well. So we, so several people not only can view it, but they can edit uh, the, the content as well. Um, you are welcome, Andrea. Happy to help. All right. So having said that, I'm going to share it while I'm, at, while I'm here. And so you notice it says only me right now, but I can say I can share it with the organization and then click on save. And now that folder is available to anyone. And when they're searching, guess what? They'll get to uh, see that content as well. So let's take a peek at one of those dashboards that I installed. There it is. Here's, here's the dashboard. Um, it's showing me visitor locations. It's showing me distribution by server. It's showing me traffic volume. It's even showing me responses over time. Time, and these are my clients' uh, successes and client errors. Let's see, there seems to be another question. Um, the question is, what is the use of duplicate? Oh, I see. So Jagadish is asking, I think this is what you mean. Let me go back in here. And um, if you go to any of these, one of the options is duplicate. That's just a copy. So if you, let's say that you want to copy this folder into some somewhere else, you can say duplicate, and then it's going to ask you, great, where do you want to duplicate this folder? So it's just give it's it's a copy. <laughs> I don't know why we call it duplicate, but it's a it's a copy, Jagadish. Okay, so let me show you this uh, folder in here. This this dashboard responses over time. Let's take a peek at how that was put together. Here we go. So I'm going to click on that. And now what I'm seeing is uh, the query itself for all the different response times. And let's say that there were status codes that's, that there was a 600 series. I could always edit this query and say, um, copy this here. And uh, I'd say if code matches. 600 then um you know something errors right whatever whatever uh whatever the 600s would be and so you notice how without even learning the language yet the syntax i can easily go and open queries that exist tweak them to my needs and then i could update the dashboard with my changes or i could just save this as a whole new query if i wanted to as well so i cannot stress enough as you're going through and looking for content um, don't start from scratch for one is look to see if there's any published content from your peers and i tell you to do this first because like andrea pointed out it's possible that they've actually installed the app and then published it and the second one is if there is nothing in there, you can always um, install the app yourself. There is absolutely no harm in two or three or four or five people or 10 people installing the app for themselves. Absolutely no harm. But um, you most likely would want to share it so that you all are going off the same, uh, the same content. So that way, if you make a change, everybody gets to see that change. Okay, so um, here's where if we were delivering this face-to-face, -face, I would stop, give you guys the uh, ability to try some labs. Um, this, by the way, is all part of the tutorial. So when you get a chance, again, I'm just going to go back to this to, just to point to you. Uh, if you uh, are doing the level one and you go to this tutorial, this tutorial has uh, exactly this part one how to view your data and that kind of stuff. So um, there you go. See, part one of the, of the tutorial. So this is all just linked to that tutorial as well. 
All right, um, let's talk about now, let's say that uh, you, it's your own logs, your own uh, custom logs. Of course, there's no app for it. You are the first one who's looking at these logs. So you'll no, need to know the query syntax. And essentially, the query syntax, as you see the, the, the stuff in here, is a bunch of keywords and operators that are separated by pipes, uh, as you see here, and they just build on top of each other. So let me show you an example. In this case, I'm saying source category equals Lab Apache Access. I only want those those lines with the word Mozilla. And by the way, once you get those results, I'm going to start parsing the lines because I want to pull out very specific fields out of that. And then once I pull out those specific fields, I want to do even additional filtering. I only want those with status code that matches 500. And then I want to count by that status code. So what you see here on the left-hand side is exactly that. You specify the metadata. You specify the keywords so you can do some filtering. Then you parse your data to do additional filtering. And then you aggregate that data. And eventually, you can format it so that you can put it on dashboards, for example. You can create some sort of chart if you want to. So with that said, let me just show you um, how you go about doing this. I'm going to try to do less less slides and more uh, stuff in, in, in the uh, in the UI. Um, so the first thing is metadata and keywords. Let me close this here for a second. And I'm just going to close these guys, and we'll just start from scratch. So let's use our friend uh, Apache Access, because everybody understands those logs. So I'm just going to stick to those, which are going to be a little easier to, uh, to, to find. So here's my source category equals Lab Apache Access. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger for you. There we go. Here's my uh, results. It looks like for the last 15 minutes, I have 117 results. Um, I can change these time frames here, last 15 minutes, last 60, three, six hours, and so on. Um, what if I want it last 45 minutes and it's not here? Well, I think you figured out the syntax. That's minus 45M. 45 minutes, M is uh, minutes, D is days. Uh, what else is there? H is hours. So you get the point. What if I wanted to do 15 minutes worth of data, but starting 30 minutes ago, I could do this. This gives me 40, uh, it goes back to minute 45, but only up to minute 30. So this is 15 minutes worth of data, but with an offset of 30 minutes ago. Um, you can also do things like this. If I do this lab Apache star, this is giving me both my Apache access as well as my Apache error logs. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna prove it to you by doing a count by source category. Remember this uh, example we did before? So if I do that, you'll see that I have a whole bunch of messages that are Apache access and a whole bunch that are Apache error as well. So you can use wildcards in the naming of your metadata. Apache access. Uh, oops, access. Um, you can also filter by um, filter by keywords. So I want my Apache access data and those that have the word Mozilla in it. And as you would expect, I can also use wildcards on those as well, just like that. So again, uh, pretty fairly straightforward. Let me just grab the last uh, 15 minutes worth of that data, run start, and I'm now finding only those that have the word Mozilla in it. Okay, this is pretty good. Uh, seems pretty simple. Um, but what I really want to do is, look, I see here something with a status code 200. This one has status code 200. Here's a 401. And so I'm starting to wonder, hey, how many, how many 400s am I getting? Am I getting a whole bunch of 404s? So what I really want to do is I want to start parsing out this 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 text here so that I can identify some of the fields and, and do some aggregation and some kind of calculation of that stuff. So I'm going to show you a couple of ways of parsing your data. Here is the easiest one. I highlight one message to use it as an example. And then I say parse the selected text. So what it's going to allow me to do is use this, this particular message as an example. Um, but it's going to apply this same logic to all my messages. It's going to say, all right, grab anything you find between the word get and the word HTTP and call that my URL. Then grab anything uh, between uh, after that that's between spaces, and that's going to be my status code. And then grab anything after that, and I think you guys get the point. That's going to be my size. And then I'm going to grab this here, and that's going to be my refer. And then last but not least, I'm going to grab all this stuff here in between quotes, and I'm going to get make my user agent, that kind of stuff. So all I did was 
put some placeholders and give them names, right? Click Submit. It builds that parse statement for me. I could have typed this if I wanted to, but it's kind of easier to, uh, to just use that UI. And look at what happens. If I hit Start, what it does is it applies that parsing statement to all the data that it pulled up with this first line. And my message is here on my right-hand side, but now parsed out is my user agent. There's my URL. There is my status code. There is my size, and you get the point. So now I could do things like um, where status code equals 404. Why? Because status code is now a field. So I can pull only those messages that are 404. Or I could get even fancier. I can say um, average uh, average size, right? Can I do that? Um, so this is, this. remember that size was one of my fields and I can see what the average size of each one of my messages is. Or I could even say average size by um, by URL. Right, so I can see which URLs are sending me um, the biggest size of things. So you, you get the point. You can start getting fairly creative there with what you want to do, and we'll, we'll get into these um, into this uh, analytics in, in just a second. But before I do that, let me talk a little bit more about this parsing. So remember, parsing what it did is it gave me the ability to extract fields, and that's very very key because before that, this is just a whole bunch of text. And it, does, it, it doesn't really help you to just have text because then you have to eyeball a lot of stuff. So parsing it out is gonna allow you to start doing the analytics that you need. So with that in mind, um, I'm gonna go here to the Home tab to show you that there is a tab called Learn tab. Why am I doing that? I'm trying to get to documentation, but I wanted to show you the Learn tab as well. There's some good videos here for you. Here is one of the two tutorials that'll help you uh, get up to speed as well. But what I was trying to do was get it to the documentation because I wanted to pull up uh, parse operators for you. So here we go. I'm gonna pull up those parse operators just to show you that there's tons of ways of parsing your data. So the one that I just showed you is called the anchor parsing. And why is it called, uh, and why could I use it? Well, I had a predictable pattern. My, my, lo my Apache logs are very, very, predictable. So I was able to say, you will always find, if you remember, I'm going to go here, you will um, you will always find in between the word get and the word HTTP, you will always find the URL. And then it's always going to be this kind of format in here. But what if your logs are not always the same format? What are your options? Well, one of the options is you can use regex. And all of us have used regex at some point in in time. So if your patterns are variable, then use regex. And um, most of us have probably done it. But just in case, here's, here's an example. This is saying, look for this pattern. This pattern says one to three digits followed by a period, one to three digits, a period, one to three digits, a period, one to three digits. We all know that that sounds pretty much like an IP address, right? So it says, find that I, that pattern and if you do it if you do find it store it in a field called the ip address as a matter of fact let me do this let me copy this line right off of our documentation and let me dump it here into our query so i'm just going to copy and paste it there you go i have two parse statements now i'm going to run the query and what you'll see is that it parsed out all the fields status code size and all that stuff and my ip address so there it is. I've just parsed my IP address from my stuff as well. And now I could do um, average size by IP address. So IP address is now a field that is available to me and I can find out average sizes by IP address. So why am I showing you all this stuff? Because it's very, very important to parse. Parsing is gonna get you a very long way. So um, it's gonna allow you to start identifying what are the fields that you want to start doing something with. Um, I won't go through all of these, but if you're sending us JSON formatted logs, guess what? We have an operator for that. If you're sending us key value pairs, name equals Mario, company equals Sumo Logic, we have an operator for that. CSV, if it's delimited by something else, like a tab or a colon, if it's XML, we have some parsing um, operators to be able to take that stuff and even auto parse it for you because we know what JSON looks like so we can auto parse it for you um, so just keep in mind you want to parse your data and i'm going to take it one step further 
um, the question that normally I get around this time is, hey, Mario, that's awesome. That is great. But um, does that mean I have to be writing these parsing statements all the time? Because that's a lot of figuring out every single time or I have to copy and paste? And the answer is no. What you can do is you can create what is called a field extraction rule. And like the name suggests, what it, it's a rule that as the data is coming into Sumo Logic, it's going to extract those fields for you. How do you do that? Well, you go to the settings area here, and you will have the ability to create field extraction rules. And how do you create them? You hit this little plus button, and you say, I want to create the Apache rule. And then you would specify the scope. But you can say, every time I'm getting data that is labs Apache access, I want to apply this parsing expression in here. And you can type whatever parsing expression. For example, I would copy and paste my parsing expressions in here. Or because we know that you, we know a lot, quite a few of these uh, logs, we can even get you a template to get you started. So we have a template here that is parsing IP address, the method, the status code, the user agent, the refer, and whatnot. Um, by the way, you could even do this. You can say, I want this rule to to um, to parse my dev Apache access, my prod Apache access, my labs Apache access. So you can even use wildcards in here as well. I'm not going to save this one because I actually already have one built. There it is. Here is, uh, as a matter of fact, let me just go and click on details. Oops. Click on edit so you can see how it was put together. Um, oh, this is the... the Oh, here's one for, for Palo Alto networks. But essentially, it's saying anything that is for labs network pan, use this path expression in here. Um, where is the one I wanted to show you? Here it is. Um, edit. So here is the one that I had built uh, before. It's saying anything that is Apache access, apply this stuff. And so how do you know which fields are available to you? Well, here is the beauty. Let me run this search without any parsing. Look at this. I'm going to get rid of the parsing, and I'm just going to run this search as it stands. What I haven't showed you is this left-hand side column here. This is what we call the field browser. And the field browser has all those fields that I care about. So, of course, there's collector, source category, host, source name. Those were just the uh, the standard metadata tags, remember? But there's IP address, there's status code, there's URL, there's user agent. These are the fields that got parsed by that field extraction rule. So I don't even have to parse them. I can actually do something like count by oh, um, status code. And there you go, because status code is already a field that has been parsed. So it makes it a lot, a lot easier. So my call to you guys is, uh, figure out what are the what are the things that you want to parse and go and build the field extraction rules. I, I did fail to mention that creating a field extraction rule is an administrative privilege. So if you don't have administrative privilege, you'll have to work with your administrator to uh, to build those field extraction rules um, and put them in place. Um, let's see, I have a question here from Jonathan. His question is, we have a few log files that are tab delimited. Is there a limit to the number of fields we can extract? Um, so the answer is no. There is no limit to the fields um, in the tab delimited. Um, let's see. He says pulling specific fields versus all fields. Um, okay. So I, I take that back. There, there is a limit, um, but the limit is so high that I can't even remember it at this point. Um, because the, the follow-up of the question is, should we pull out all the fields or just the relevant fields in your log? Um, there is a limit. and uh, uh, Jonathan, I owe you that limit. I can't remember what it is. I, I would say if your if your fields are in the tens, then just go ahead and pull them all because you might need them later on. If your fields are in the hundreds, then it probably makes sense to just pull the ones that make sense for you um, so you don't have to be pulling a whole bunch of uh, fields out there. Um, having said that, if you ever need more fields, if you need us to move the limit, uh, you can always open a support case and we're more than happy to work with you. Uh, to open those, uh, to, to increase those limits. All right, um, excellent. Okay, so um, let's let's continue here. So I I uh, I put my my query. I'm now looking at status code. Status code is a field that exists, and I can just use it. Um, but 
if I were you, if I'm if I'm looking at this data, let's say that I'm looking at 60 minutes worth of data, right? Let's say I'm the, I'm a developer and I'm looking at the code that I just pushed out and I'm looking at status codes and I see that there's 10,000 404s. That means that my code probably has a whole bunch of broken links in there and, and I'm getting to some 404 in there. So um, I might want to know in this 60 minutes, were these 404s all popping up at the same time or were they distributed evenly across the, the 60 minutes? So I'm gonna introduce a new operator that's called time slice. And as the name suggests, what time slice allows me to do is time slice. It allows me to break those 60 minutes into time buckets. I can say like, let, let's break it into five minute buckets, for example, or one minute buckets if I wanted to. In this case, I'm gonna say five minute buckets. And now I'm going to count uh, not, only by, um, not only by status code, but I'm gonna count by time slice as well. And let me just mention something. You notice that I put an underscore in front of time slice here. The reason for that is because when you use an operator, like in this case, count, uh, the result is always a, an underscore in the same name. Unless I name it something else, it's gonna be underscore count, right? So if I use time slice here, the result of a time slice is an underscore, underscore time slice. So let me show you the results of this. What this is showing me now is it's showing me, uh, since I broke it by five minute buckets, it's showing me that at 10.05 for status code 503, I had this many. And at 10.15 for status code 500, I had this many. And you get the point. It's showing me every time slice and every status code, every possible combination and the count. This is a little hard to read. So what I'm gonna do is I am gonna show you yet another operator called transpose. And what transpose allows me to do is allows me to pivot this list into a table. So I can say that my rows are gonna be my time slice and my columns are gonna be my status code. And it's just gonna make it readable and easier for me to take a peek at this stuff. Um, there you go. So now it's showing me that at 9.55, I had this many for each one of these status codes. And this kind of answers my question. I see that my 404s are somewhat, uh, yeah, are evenly distributed across um, my different time slices, which is, which is a good thing. Um, they're not all happening at the same time. By the way, I did not choose this query randomly. This is a query that is very, very useful for just about anything. Of course, I'm showing you status codes for Apache, but this could be error codes for your own environment. This could be event codes for Windows. This could be, uh, you name it. What I'm showing you here is a combination of three um, of three operators that make up for a good way to tell a story, a good way to tell uh, the counts of something, in this case, status codes over time. And the beauty of this is that from a table to a graph is as simple as doing this kind of stuff here. I can choose whatever diagram I want to uh, report this on. Let's say that we chose bars. Um, of course, most of my stuff is 200. So why don't we toggle that one off here for a second? 304s is the ne next one. I'm gonna toggle those off for just a second here. Um, and this is my graph without uh, my 304s and my 200s. How would I get rid of my 304s and my 200s permanently? Well, I could do two things. I'm gonna show you the, the good way and then I'm gonna show you the better way. So one of the ways that I could do it is I could have a where clause, right? I could say where um, status code, oh, status code, yeah, equals 200 or status code equals 304. And since I don't want those, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put a bang or a not in front of it. So this is gonna get rid of them, right? This is gonna pull out all my messages. And then once it has all those messages, it's gonna say, wait, I don't want the ones with these status codes. Okay, now with the ones that are left, time slice it, count it, and all that good stuff, and I get my results. But if you guys remember, status code is already a field that has been pulled out. So in reality, I can just move this stuff up to the previous field and just say, and not status code. The more filtering, and um, keep this in mind, the more filtering you do in the first line, the better, because that means that's less messages that you're bringing in, and that you're that's less operators that you have to go through, uh, or less uh, operations that you have to do on, on each one of those messages. So do as much filtering as you can at the top, and that's gonna make life a lot better uh, from a performance perspective for you. 
All right, so here is my chart and I'm feeling pretty happy. I can chart this and I'll show you in just a second. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna tweak this and say, um, each one of these options in here has additional options. So for example, let's say I wanted to highlight my 404s. I could do something like change series and I'm gonna change my 404s to be a line chart instead of a combo chart. And look what happens. I can now highlight my 404s and graphically see them standing out against the rest of the bars, which are my the rest of my, uh, of my um, status codes. Okay, so um, before I go into dashboards and that kind of stuff, um, I just wanted to uh, kind of briefly come back and say, uh, this this is what the syntax looks like. I uh, I'm not going to dive much deeper. There's uh, other webinars that allow you to do that. But essentially, what I've shown you is how to pull out the metadata and keywords, how to start parsing your data, and I show you some of the different operators. How to start filtering your data. I, I showed you how to use the where operator. But there's a few others that you can definitely tackle: the join, the look of the matches, the filter. Um, how to start aggregating your data. And there's the basic ones: the count, the average, the percent, and so on. And then last but not least, you can. Start start formatting that data. Perhaps you just want to show the top uh, number of, of users. You want to hide some fields because you want to graph and you don't want to show some of the fields that are in your in your results. You can transpose that stuff as well. Um, what One of the things I didn't show you is Livetail. Livetail, as the name suggests, allows you to, um, let me just open a little, live, um, hold on, before I do that, let me just copy this. So I don't have to type it. What Livetail, as the name suggests, allows you to do is it allows you to um, look at your query in uh, in real time. So in this case, uh, your data in real time. Um, this is great. If I'm a developer, I don't even have access to my production environment. If I did, I'd probably have to jump through several hoops to get to that. But now all of a sudden here through the UI, I'm getting access to not just one box, and the and the web server logs for that box, but across all my boxes, because if this if they used if when we set this up, we used source categories lab Apache access for all my boxes. This is great. I'm seeing all the logs for all my web servers at once, and I can still do things like and Mozilla, right? So I only want those words that all the, those lines that have the word Mozilla. I can do things like highlight uh, if I have 404s highlight the word Mozilla, highlight the word error, and you get the point. I could do some sort of highlighting. I can pause this, I can scroll up, I can scroll down as you would expect uh, with other stuff, or I could jump to the bottom and continue uh, looking at my logs in here. So again, a super, super nifty tool, um, uh, especially if I don't have access to production environment. Now, a couple of things about this. One is, um, if you don't want to look at it through the UI, um, no worries. There is a command line interface tool that allows you to do um, to 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 live tail as well. And um, let me just briefly show it to you here. CLI. Of course, you'll have to download a client, uh, do a little bit of a handshake. Um, but once you install it, then you can do stuff like this. You can you can run queries that say live tail source source host local host you can say live tail source category calls prod mic you know as we have been doing or you can even do stuff like that like this you can say live tail source category slab apache access pipe that and pipe it into a grep um, command which then you can put out in a in a text file and that kind of stuff so you can start combining your unix commands with your uh, with the live tail commands as well which is um, I've heard pretty cool for a lot of our users um, as they're trying to get some stuff done. Um, so yeah, Lifetail is a pretty powerful tool. Um, one of the things that you cannot do in here is, of course, you cannot start aggregating, you cannot start parsing, you cannot start doing all that stuff because this is just meant to complement the other stuff. So if you want to parse, if you want to aggregate, then what you really want to do is you want to go in uh, and show the same search in your search screens where you then have the full power to use log reduce and all that other stuff that we've been talking about before. Okay, so in the interest of time, let me close some of these things. Um, there are, of course, a few other advanced analytics, which I won't cover here today, uh, but uh, the webinar that is starting tomorrow and the day after, definitely dive into these other advanced analytics um, operators um, that allow you to do more stuff, like do a put together a little map with all the all the um, all the 
points where your where your IP addresses are coming from, uh, identifying outliers, predicting what is happening in your environment. I showed you today in the demo how to use log reduce, log compare, but these are other operators that allow you to tackle a few more things um, that are specific to logs and logs analytics out there. Um, but now let's switch gears and let's talk about okay, how can I monitor my data? How can I create dashboards and alerts that um, that are going to help me monitor this stuff? So. Alert uh, dashboards are pretty easy to build. Essentially, a dashboard is just a collection of panels, and panels have some sort of query behind them, right? So in this case, I'm highlighting two panels in this dashboard, and each one of those panels has a query behind it. So to build a dashboard, it's incredibly easy. Let me actually build a dashboard from scratch just now. Remember this search that we just ran? Here it is with uh, with uh, with our little uh, showcase there. All you have to do is click Add to Dashboard. And it says, great, I'm going to create a new query. What, what do you want to call it? Let's call it uh, status codes, Apache status codes. Apache status codes. And I'm going to put it in an existing dashboard so I can choose any of my existing dashboards. Or if I br have a brand new dashboard, um, I can just create it add the name and it's going to create a dashboard and you can ask me it asks me where do I want to store it I'm just going to keep it in my personal folder click on add and voila I have a dashboard that yes it only has one panel because that's the only thing that I've added so far but there is my dashboard right there with my uh, with my status codes. Um, there's a couple of things I can do here with dashboards. The first one is, um, let's talk about this panel. I can change the name. I can click on this little icon in here and switch this to table format, to bar format, column format. So some of the same stuff that I could do before, I can I can kind of do from here as well, right? Um, if I go to general, I can do some stacking. I can I can change. By the way, this this kind of stuff I could also do uh, on the chart before I added it to the dashboard. One of the things that I that I can that I can uniquely do through here is dashboard linking. So, by default, when you click on a panel, it takes you to the query behind it. But if you want to change that behavior, if I if I want to have someone click on a panel and take me to a different dashboard, I can do that from here. I can say enable link dashboard and I can link it to another dashboard. Um, what other stuff can I do? I can change the axes if I want to. I can change the color series if I want to as well. What I cannot do is I cannot change the query. You notice that it's grayed out and I can't change it. There's a good reason for that. The reason for that is because we don't want you to tweak the query and end up with a broken query in your dashboard. Instead, what we force you to do is to go back to the search, try it out, and if all works, then you add it back to the dashboard. But I'll show you that in just a second. Um, let's uh, let's add another panel to our dashboard. So I'm gonna just for to make it easy, I'm gonna add one of these guys and click Add to Dashboard. It's gonna ask me. Um, let's call it my table to keep it simple, and I'm gonna add it to that same dashboard and click on Add. And what you will see is that it just added the same data just in a different format but you could you could say that this could have been a completely different um, data as well so as simple as that I just created my first dashboard um, there's a couple of other things that I can do here I can uh, to to follow up with Andrea's question earlier I can share my dashboard so right now it's only me but I can share that dashboard with the organization, meaning anybody who has a logon into Sumo Logic from my organization can view it. I can whitelist it. This means that I can say, I only I want people who have this URL to a, be able to see it, but only those coming from certain IP addresses or CIDRs. So I have to go into Manage Security Service Whitelist and add those IP addresses or CIDRs there. But this is a way to allow people um, who don't have a login into your organization to be able to see those dashboards. And the last one in here is world. And world means anyone in the world who has access to this uh, URL could uh, could look at this dashboard as well. A little more dangerous, but sometimes you might have a need for this kind of stuff as well. So a couple of options. I'm going to keep it safe. I'm just going to share it with my organization and click on save. So now there you go. My dashboard has been shared. This has been turned to blue because I've shared it with a few people. Um, other things that you can do. 
you can toggle the theme so you can make it a dark theme if you wanted to you can add non-text panels so per, for example let's say i wanted to add a title my first dashboard um, or you can add some text and text as uh, silly as it sounds is actually pretty um pretty good because uh sometimes you might be the one who built the dashboard but it might be some other people who are consuming the data in that dashboard um, this is in spanish by the way that's why it's hard for you guys to understand what it says um, but uh in here also you can add links to other dashboards as well if you wanted to and if i submit that there i have my text i'm going to just move it up here make this look a little prettier i'm going to put my uh my title up there as well oops and I'm gonna. Oh, I I just moved my uh, my screen. Sorry. Um, so yeah, you can you can start moving things around however you need to in in your dashboard, and uh, and build your dashboard according to whatever you want. But there you go. I've got a title. Maybe I want this title to go across the board here. Um, and in that case, I would need to make this a little bit smaller. But my point is, in less than uh, in less than 15 minutes, I was able to create a dashboard, make it look good, and share it with uh, whomever I want out there. Of course, I can delete it, I can start it, I can put it full screen. But the last thing I'm gonna show you here is I can add filters. And by adding filters, I mean I can put some stuff in here that I might want to um, to allow other users to filter by. Let's say, for example, that, um, I don't know, maybe we're looking for just a very specific source IP or, or very specific users or, or a specific year or something like that. I can add a filter and then I can, uh, let me make this look a little bit better, enter the IP in question. So, uh, now other users can come into this dashboard. Normally they would see this. They can click on the filtering icon. They can enter the IP address that they want to filter by. And then all the dashboards panels would reset. Of course, there's no data for that IP address, but you see what's happening. All the, all the dashboard panels get reset to try to use that filter uh, with their data in there. Um, and that's how you can use those. One last thing I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna go to done editing. If you plan to display this dashboard in your operation center, um, then you can turn your dashboard into live mode. That means I want this dashboard to be running constantly on the back end and be updated on a regular basis. Every two seconds, refresh with new data. And then that way I don't have to be rerunning this dashboard so that it has data. I can put it up in my operation center and the dashboard is gonna be up to date. I'm not gonna set it up to live mode now because it uh, just runs queries in the background that I, I don't wanna hit. So there you go. That's the uh, that's the easy way of creating dashboards. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if you want to edit a dashboard, a panel for some reason, like I said before, uh, you go back to edit mode. You um, you go to the query itself. You can tweak the query. Let's say that I want to uh, I want to do this instead of five minutes. I want to do this every ten minutes. So now I run the query. My my dashboard is now showing me only ten minute increments. Ten. 10, 20, 30, 40, and then I can update the dashboard. And what that's gonna do is, it's going to go and make the change to the dashboard itself. Now it's every 10 minutes and I'm done with uh, editing the dashboard. Okay, last thing I'm gonna show you is alerts. And alerts are, um, they're easy to do. Actually, the mechanics of creating an alert is super, super easy. Um, in future courses, we're gonna talk about creating meaningful alerts. There's a link here to, to, to these key principles, but we'll talk about it in future ones. But let me just walk you through how to create an alert. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna cheat here a little bit and I'm gonna go open a query that is a little bit, it's a little more meaningful. Around, uh, around alerts. I'm gonna go to training, alerts, and just open. Um, I'm gonna show you an easy way, a very simple scenario of creating, an, uh, um, of creating an alert. Let's say that I wanna look at all my messages that have a 404, and here's the response. These are all the messages that have a 404. Um, actually, let me get rid of this where cost first. In the last 60 minutes, I'm gonna time slice this by one minute and look at all the ones that have 404s. And it looks like it hovers around 200 and something. So maybe what I wanna do is say, if I ever have uh, a time slice that the count is greater than 250, then I wanna, I wanna see that and I wanna alert on that. So look at this one, it has more than 2000. So yeah, this is good. Why don't we say, if I ever have anything that is higher than 
500 alert me or, or show me the results. And in this case, there are some results in there. So what if I wanted to create an alert on that? sometime where there's a huge outlier like it's showing in here. So all I have to do is save this query. And as part of saving that query, I have the ability to schedule that search. So I'm gonna schedule that search. Right now it's defaulted to never. I'm gonna say run, I don't know, every hour. Every hour choose 60 minutes worth of data and send me a notification, not every time it completes, because that might be an uninteresting. Instead, I'm gonna put a condition here. If the number of results is ever greater than zero, alert me. Why does that work? Because if I get zero results, that means that everything is below 500. But if I ever have results, then that means that something is greater than 500. I can alert myself. If I choose email, I can just send myself a, uh, um, a little email here um, and then I can I have a few options in here I can choose some alert subjects I have the ability to uh, to choose uh, a couple of the what I want to show in that alert and save it and essentially that schedules the alert it runs on an hourly basis and it gives me um, the ability to send that message on a regular basis. Uh, for those of you joining the next uh, webinar, I'll, I'll talk about some of the other options that are available in here, including sending this through like a hip chat or a pager duty or that kind of stuff. Um, but in short, the mechanics for creating alerts are as simple as that. You have a query, you normally ended up with a where clause so that you can limit the amount of results, and then you schedule that to, uh, to run on a regular basis. Okay, so I've talked a lot in this hour and a half. I know that I've given you a lot of info. You notice that there are hands-on labs, which I would highly recommend that you guys try. Essentially, those are those hands-on labs. If you go to your instance and go to the home tab and go to the learn tab in there, it's this tutorial in here, this tutorial called using Sumo Logic. If you go through this tutorial, that's exactly the same thing that these labs are pointing you to, to try out, which are the exact same labs that you you wanna do to prepare for the certification itself. Um, last but not least, I'll talk briefly about metrics. You saw me in my uh, in my demo um, core, do, do what we call overlay, the ability to overlay your logs to your metrics because your metrics help you identify the what, your logs help you identify the why. Um, we can get metrics from, uh, from your host machines. We can get metrics from AWS through a CloudWatch. And we can pick up any graphite compatible metrics through something like a DropWish or a CollectD or a StatsD, um, which makes it a lot easier. And of course, of course, you saw that on the demo, but your dashboards can contain panels from both metrics and logs. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. You can have them all in, in one same place. All right, so uh, with that said, um, where do you go from here? What I would suggest is uh, check out our Learn tab. I've, I've pointed you there quite a bit already. Our Learn tab has uh, some tutorials, which you should explore. It has our uh, links to our technical documentation. It has uh, it points points you to training community. Um, if you haven't checked it out yet, I would strongly suggest you check out our community. Our community has uh, tons of wealth uh, wealth of information, not just from us, but from other users as well. So if you go here into community, you see that we, we've broken it down by, are you concerned about sending data to Sumo, general discussions, how to use Sumo, but also something that's pretty meaningful is this query library. It's got a lot of queries that are fairly meaningful for you to, uh, to try out. So for example, I'm just gonna go choose something here, like um, here, identifying trends over time. Uh, look, this nice guy, Mario, put some stuff in here for us. But uh, what you see, look at this. This looks very, very similar to what we built today, doesn't it? Parsing, time slice, counting, transposing. So what this is, is a query that it doesn't matter what your data is. It doesn't matter what you're trying to identify the trends for. Um, this serves as a good template for you to identify trends over time with just about anything, right? So this query library is full of a whole bunch of uh, queries like that that will help you uh, that will help you get out there. Here's another one from uh, from Graham. In this case, Graham is helping you detect outliers for 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 large set of entities and he gives you some examples and how to do it in there as well. So um, yeah, try it out when you get a chance. Definitely go to community. There's a wealth of information in there. You can from here also open a support case. 
Um, but last but not least is um, I would say you are well prepared now to uh, to try out the certification. So when you can, um, either from the training page or go straight to this uh, folder here, you can now, um, after trying some of the tutorials, take some of the exams. So let me pause there. Let me open it up to questions. Uh, I will pause the recording as well so that I can uh, share that with you guys and wait to see if you have any questions.